NDP leader Jagmeet Singh spearheaded a successful motion in the House of Commons that saw the majority of MPs vote for Johnston to step down from his position over perceptions he's in a conflict of interest. But the former Governor General insisted today, once again, he is not going anywhere. Mr. Singh was there at the committee to question Johnston himself. He joins us now live in studio. Hi, Mr. Singh. Good to see you. Thanks very much for making the time. Good to see you, too. During all of those clips, we had a banner, uh, a, a sort of headline on, on the TV that asked whether or not this testimony changed anything. Did it for you? It did, actually, in some ways. It, it highlighted what to me is a really troubling revelation was that when I put to Mr. Johnston the fact that I, I was the only person that was asking questions really on substance instead of kind of process or asking about things that have already been litigated, I really want to understand about the interference itself. And I asked him about the difference between what CSIS had told Mr. O'Toole and what he disclosed in terms of he was targeted by uh, the Chinese government and it was identified as the Chinese government and Mr. Johnson saying that he was not able to determine if conservatives that were targeted in the 2021 election he was unable to say that it was distinctly or, or certainly definitively the Chinese government the fact that uh, that difference exists that I put to him well, well what do you make of that and he kind of suggested that he had different information than Mr. Toole did that to me is troubling. If he did not receive all the information, how is he making his assessment of the government's actions without having all the information? Well, well, and just to break this down for everybody who's watching who didn't read his report, what, as you said, what he concluded about what happened in 2021, that he couldn't say for sure it was state-sponsored activities uh, from China targeting either Mr. O'Toole or some of the Conservative candidates. And then Mr. O'Toole very recently was briefed by Canada's spy agency under this new direction from the Prime Minister that he was targeted and that all of this stuff had happened to those uh, candidates. What you put to Mr. Johnson, as you said, is how can those two things be true at the same time? And I thought he didn't just kind of suggest, I thought he pretty much said, we didn't have that information. Uh, and it was not part of my analysis. Does that undermine the conclusions he reached based on the analysis? Absolutely. And if anything, it really just bolster, bolsters our initial ask, which is to have a public inquiry. The fact that uh, it's not clear that he received the same information, in fact, you're right, I think he said very clearly he didn't receive the same information. That really undermines the conclusions, and it really, again, begs the question then, why are we continuing down a path where it's uncertain if we're, we're looking at the same evidence, a public inquiry would have the rigor of cross-examination, exactly what I did. Those questions would be asked, and then we'd challenge the evidence and try to find out if we're looking at the full picture or not, and then have better conclusions. Are you sure that would be the case? And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking, because you were able to ask those questions of Mr. Johnston today, so were many other members of Parliament over the course of three hours. That committee has the power to call... Uh, a myriad of witnesses associated with this issue. Uh, the Committee of Parliamentarians who are sworn to secrecy and able to view classified information, they're also conducting their own investigation. What conclusions or what, what information do you think a public inquiry will dig up that all of these other vehicles in some, I think there's 350 witnesses that have been heard from on this issue over the last number of years, that all of those vehicles in some can't do? There are, there are separate paths that each of these avenues can take. But what a public inquiry does is bring it all together in a public forum with the independence and with the credibility of something that has that rigor. And the reason why I bring up rigor is that when you are testing evidence and you're seeing witnesses be cross-examined versus a special rapporteur is making his finding without seeing his work. It's kind of like when you're in school and you can see the math homework and you get an answer versus when you can see the work that arrived at that answer. That gives people more confidence. The process is really, in my mind, about restoring confidence in democracy because people should believe that their democracy works and it functions and it is free from interference. And if there's any sort of allegation of interference, we're taking it seriously so that people can have confidence that their vote matters. That, to me, is the ultimate goal. And without a public inquiry, that restoring of confidence, that is not happening. Mr. Johnson and the Prime Minister, in order to do just that, they say, offered you and other members of the uh, other leaders, pardon me, of the opposition parties a briefing, an opportunity for you to look at the information that they did arrive, that, that did lead them rather to arrive at the conclusions they did, um, so that you can have confidence in them. Have you had that briefing yet? I've not. I'm the only leader that's accepted yep. that offer. I will be doing it. I've asked for a couple of clarifications, which I've received verbal confirmation. I'm just waiting on written confirmation. I want to have the same latitude that Mr. Johnson had to provide 
my opinion, whether or not the government did what was sufficient, whether or not a public inquiry is still required or not. I want to be able to provide my opinion on that. I've been assured that that, of course, will be the case. Waiting for that in writing, and then the next steps where we're just waiting to follow through on the next steps for the clearance and then to receive the documents. So uh, the, you have, though, been told, basically, you can still talk about this stuff even if you do receive that briefing? Absolutely. And, and as I expected, I mean, this is something that I assume just the same way Mr. Johnson was able to provide his opinion without in any way compromising national security, he could still say, having looked at this evidence, I make this final following conclusion. I want to be able to do the same thing. I've been assured I can and I will be able to and I'm waiting for the next steps. How soon do you anticipate the briefing can happen? That is a very good question. We haven't been received any clear deadline in terms of when, when it'll happen or how long it'll take. I want it to happen as soon as possible and I'm ready and willing to do it whenever. I also want to ask you about what I think is among Canadians a perception that they're trying to make sense of exactly where you fall on this and a host of other things to do with the government, right? Because right now your position is that you're keeping this government in power, in effect. Um, and, and more specific to this issue, you're demanding a public inquiry. You want Mr. Johnson to get removed. You, you, hold, you introduce a motion to that effect. But at the same time, you've said that you're not willing to force an election because you don't want uh, one to happen before confidence in the electoral system is restored. How do you square that circle for Canadians? Well, there's a couple things that need to happen. One, I still need to look at the information myself. I think that's one big major step. We also need to make sure that there's some recommendations that are put in place. Some of the findings that Mr. Johnson made can be actioned. One of the things is the massive failure of communication. I think it also indicts not just CSIS, but also indicts the government's lack of real attention to following up, to doing any follow-up questions. They were, they were clearly advised that foreign interference had happened in two elections in a row. Despite that, they never took it upon themselves, neither the Prime Minister nor the Ministers, to ask, well, if this is happening, are MPs being targeted? They never asked that question. I accept that they may not have been told by CSIS that that was happening, one way or the other, but they didn't actually proactively ask, and I asked that question, Mr. Johnson. So I'm concerned that those recommendations that are already out there should be action. There should be steps taken to ensure that we're, we're ad addressing this, this interference. And uh, I really want to have people believe and have confidence in our institutions. But how will you measure that? Well, one of the ways is to make sure that all the information that we can have is out there. Um, having some steps taken to address some of the recommendations that we have so far. I'm not going to let up on a public inquiry. I still think that's the, the real ultimate way to restore confidence. But if one doesn't steps happen, along the way. You're, not going to, you're not going to force the issue. I'm going to continue to put pressure on it, but I don't think it makes sense if my concern genuinely is that we need to restore confidence in our electoral system to trigger an election to restore confidence in something that's been interfered with. That isn't something, to my, to, in my opinion, that's a genuine concern for our democratic institution. It sounds like me more of a, an excuse or looking for an excuse to trigger an election. What do you say to skeptics who say that you're worried about losing your position as leader of the party or the party's ability to afford to enter into a ne the next election. And that's really what's behind what you're saying on this. Well, I can respond quickly to both. Uh, we are in a position to fight an election at, at any time if it's called. We've done it in the past. We'll do it again. And in fact, our polling position is significantly better now than it's been in previous elections while being leader. So we would certainly do better. That's not my motivation, though. My motivation truly is... This isn't a political is, calculation. Well, the one calculation I have, which is a major pressure on my shoulders, is that I genuinely want to see dental care delivered. And that, to me, is going to save, uh, help millions of people save money, but also fix their teeth. And that's something I don't want to let up on. If we remove our support from the agreement, really, it's letting the liberals off the hook. They don't really want to bring in dental care. We've got to fight and push for it. They would be happy that they don't have to deliver this. They voted against it in the you past. You think they're really not going to deliver it? They've already put it into their budget implementation Unless we bill. force them. I, I, I can't disclose too many details, but right now we're, we're, we're working on the actual implementation. That's a fight to make sure it's delivered in the best way possible. That's a program that's going to work, that's going to be accessible to a, a number of people. We're fighting every step of the way to deliver the best program possible. They would, they would love to be off the hook and not have an agreement that forces them to deliver something that they're very reluctant so to deliver. So you don't want to trigger an election until the full dental program is implemented? Isn't that years out? Well, the goal of this agreement for me wasn't to find an excuse to break it. I actually genuinely want to force this government which does not want to deliver things to make them do these things. I want to bring in protection for workers. I want to bring in pharmacare. I want to bring in dental care. This is what I got elected to do. I want to make these things happen. Right, but at the same time, happen. you're keeping them in power, a government that, in your estimation, is not taking the issue of foreign interference seriously. Well, they're not taking it seriously. It's clear from the Prime Minister's actions. He's not taking it seriously. We've got a, 
opposition leader that's making a game out of it over the top accusations but and he's attacks. he's able to do that because he's prime minister because you're supporting him. Well, the reality is that my job as an opposition leader is to put pressure on the government to do the right thing. If they do the right thing or not, that's up to them. Like that's their, that's their, they're going to have to answer that question to the electors. I'm going to put forward my opinion. I've made it clear I disagree with Mr. Johnson, but more importantly, I disagree with the prime minister. I've pushed back, I forced votes, and I'll continue to do that. I'm trying to walk a line where I want to force this government to deliver for people, to help them out, to give them a break in a tough time, and also to hold them account. And that's the path that I'm walking. Mr. Singh, I have to leave it there. I'm out of time. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it as always. Thank you. Jagmeet Singh is the leader of the NDP. We're going to dig into Mr. Johnson's committee appearance with the front bench.